Welcome to Destiny. We're so glad you're here. Take a look at what's going on here at Destiny Church. We only have one week left until Easter. On your way out, make sure to grab as many invites as you can and pass them out to everyone you know. Services will be held at 7 a.m., 8.30 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. Remember, there will be no 6 p.m. on Easter Sunday. Can't wait to see you and your loved ones next Sunday. Baptism Sunday will be on April 28th, the Sunday after Easter. Make sure to visit the Welcome Center after service to sign up or head over to destiny.online for more information. Good Friday is coming up. We will be having service Friday evening. We hope to see you there. Mark your calendars. May 5th will be our Life Group launch party. Life is better together. There will be plenty of groups for you to get connected, so come have fun with us. Check out the Welcome Center for more information. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of service. Welcome, everybody. So glad to be here tonight. Amen. Glad to have you here. Welcome to Holy Week. And this is definitely Holy Week as we um, really celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our, our Lord and Savior. And, and uh, what a week to really draw closer to Christ and really reflect on your walk with him and, and really reflect where you're at and where are some of the areas in some sense um, you need to improve in or get better in. And uh, Lisette and I love to, to fast during this time to really kind of just uh, reflect, refuel, refresh our lives and really get a really good focus on what um, God's doing in us and through us. And so it's very, very exciting. And um, if you're probably wondering why is this screen up here, um, as uh, before I, I get started, something I have to get used to, um, and that is that our new campus that um, will be our new East Campus will be our broadcast campus. And what that really means is really we're going to be doing a lot of live streaming and also have the ability to go into our other campuses um, when, when, when needed, especially on vision weekends or different things like that. So I'm kind of getting used to using this as my teaching guide. So it's going to be good. So I'm excited. So I'm practicing tonight <laughs> so, so I can kind of get it down on Sunday. So y'all got to help me out a little bit, all right? And, uh, and then also, uh, it was awesome today. We got to meet with our audio team. Uh, they drove all the way down from L.A. at our new campus and uh, met with um, our, um, our, uh, uh, our coffee shop team and all that kind of stuff. So things are moving along like shh, really fast. And uh, for the design and, and how it's going to look and what are some thoughts, you know, and stuff like that. So um, we're, we're very excited what God's doing. Um, and so continue to pray for us. And uh, it's going to be great. Amen. 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 You ready to get in the Word today? Word. Can, you, can you stand to your feet and give the Lord a big clap offering? Those watching online, God bless you. We love you. Thank you for watching. Galatians chapter 6, the book of Galatians chapter 6, I think I need it closer, but I'm going to be all right, okay? Y'all bear with me, all right? Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 17, here's what it says. It says, from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that I show belong to Jesus. Just think about that. I bear on my body to show the scars that I belong to Jesus. Today I want to talk to you about scars that save and really what do his scars 
really mean. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive, a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never, never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say amen. You may be seated. If you have a message outline, our ushers would be more than happy to get you one. We've been in this series on scars and really been talking about the scars that really um, save our lives and that when God does give you um, or allows your scars to be healed, it's actually the evidence of the fact that at one time you were in pain. And so we've learned that over the last two weeks is that there's a reason why there were scars in some sense that remained on the body of Jesus, even though in some sense he was completely healed of those wounds. And that is because it was the evidence to those who were doubting that it was he who was still on or at that one time was on the cross. And here's what we learned so far. We learned that on the body of Jesus, the scars was that the scars took place in both of his hands. Also, his feet, his side, his head, and his back. And every one of them have tremendous significance when it comes to our lives. And in the lives that we live today, we all have scars. And here's what scars mean. Scars simply mean this. They mean that you were strong enough than what tried to hurt you. So the whole time that you are having or you have these scars remaining on your body is a sign that at one time you had pain there, and now by the overcoming blood of Jesus, your life has overcame those. And so for you and I, here's what we have to understand. Scars, God turns to stars. In other words, what happens is, is that you're able to show them, and this is what we've been talking about, that at the end of the day, what people want is they want the transparency of believers, and they're not interested in how much theology you know. They're not interested if you pray 10 hours a day. What they just want to know is, is, hey, man, show me some of the wounds that you had that in some sense you overcame those uh, from what you were going through. And that's the greatest testimony that in some sense you can give to somebody is really show them the path or the scars that were at one time on your life because it is the evidence that you went through something. The one thing that I love about Resurrection Week is that it kind of gives us a path. David talks about that in Psalms chapter 16. He says this, for you bring me, listen to me, a continual revelation. Just think about that. Not something that is a, a, an event. Here's what we got to do. We, we cannot let Easter just be an event. We got to make sure that it is a continual revelation. Every single day, I should have a continual revelation, watch this, of a resurrection life. That every single day, I want to be reminded that where I was, where I'm at, and where I'm going. One of the things that often you get stuck in is you get stuck in on where you're at. Understand that you were one day stuck somewhere else. And when you were stuck somewhere else, God resurrected you. God God turned that situation around. This is what it means to have a continual revelation of the resurrection. Here's what I love about it. It says, the path to the bliss that brings me face to face with you. Just think about that. This continual revelation that we're going to have when it comes to our Good Friday service, when it comes to Easter Sunday, this is something that we should use it as a ramp in some sense to kind of jump into the next part and the next season of, of the year that every single day God give me a continual revelation of my resurrected life. Here, here's, here's what the enemy does. The enemy wants to give you a continual revelation of your old life a continual revelation of your old habits, a continual revelation of who you were. This is why every day you need to be reminded that it's an Easter every single day for my life because it's a continual revelation of my life, what it is now and what it is becoming. And this is why every day we got to ask ourselves, what's my next step? What are these steps all about? What's next? And we believe that God gives us four steps here. The first step is what we call meet. That every day I want to wake up and I want to meet with God. The first appointment you should have every day is with Jesus. 
It shouldn't be on Facebook. It shouldn't be Instagram. Come on, it should be with Jesus. You should get in the Word in the morning every single day. It's, it's like waking up. I love it. I wake up. I grab me a cup of coffee. I open up my Bible. It's like giving Jesus a morning kiss. I mean, you just want to make sure that every day I'm meeting with Jesus. Because here's what happens. When I wake up every morning and I get to meet with Jesus and he meets me exactly where I'm at, he's going to move my life. I can expect every day from God to move me from where I am to where I need to be. Listen, you cannot be moved if you're not meeting him. So I got to meet him. I want to make sure we move. Listen, and then once I meet him in the morning, he moves me throughout my day. Guess what he's doing? He's making my life. Listen, we let him make us according to your God-given design. The reason why most of us are not being made is because we have not been moved. We're not moving because we haven't met him in the morning. Man, I, I want to make sure that every single day, man, I'm meeting with Jesus. Listen, I'm having this continual revelation of, of the resurrection life. Listen, I want to move. I want to be made. And guess what's going to happen to your day? You're going to multiply every day in your life, and you're going to start making a difference in the lives of others. And so this is, this is the whole point of having a resurrection life. A resurrection life says, man, I got steps now. Man, I got to meet him. I want, to, I want him to move me. I want him to make me. And finally, man, God, I want you to multiply every area in my life. And when we do, it's because, listen, we have a continual revelation of his resurrection. But you can't, listen, you can't just only focus on Sunday, resurrection, if you're not thinking about Friday when he died on the cross for your life. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He says, for the, for the message of the cross, listen, the, the cross does have a message. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But watch what it says. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so, so the message of this cross, what is the message of the cross? What does it simply mean that I'm, gonna, that, that, that I'm taking my cross every day? It equals a life of multiplication. Here's what it means to live in the resurrection life that God, that God wants me to have a continual revelation of. Here's what it means. John chapter 8, verse 36. So if the Son sets you free... Come on, somebody, you will be free indeed. And so when I meet God in the morning and he moves me and he makes me and he begins to multiply me, friends, and you're having this continual revelation of not your old life, but your resurrection life, can I tell you what's going to happen? You're not just going to be free, you're going to stay free. And so you just don't want, God set me free. Oh, no, no, God, I know you set me free. God, no, keep me free. How do, you, how, how, do I, how do I stay free? How do I stay free from old habits? How do I stay free from my old lifestyle? How do I stay free from the old stinking thinking? I meet him in the morning. Listen, he makes my life. He moves my life. He begins to multiply my life. That I got to remind myself when I'm looking in the mirror, for some of you combing your hair, for me it's shaving my head, and it's this. It's saying I have a continual revelation. I'm, I, don't, I don't want a continual revelation of my old life. I want a continual revelation of my resurrection life. Isaiah saw this almost 1,500 years before it happened. In Isaiah chapter 53, look what he says. He says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought his peace was on him. Listen, and by his wounds that were scars, listen, we are healed. If the scars of Jesus healed you, then the scars on your life can heal somebody else. Stop being ashamed of your past. Stop talking yourself down about your past. Those are mistakes that God now wants to turn into miracles. Because your bad path can keep somebody off that path. And as long as you're willing to show them, hey, here's where I was, but God's resurrection power changed my life, guess what? I, you don't have to go through that. You don't have to experience that. Why? Because by his scars, by his stripes, listen, we are healed in Jesus' name. And so this is why none of us should be ashamed of that. 
Shouldn't be ashamed of my old life. I was talking to a friend recently, and we were talking about our past, and we were talking about things we went through. I go, it's amazing. We look at things from the beginning, and we go, man, that's going to be tough. And then we get through it, and then we look back, and we go, man, I'm so glad I went through that. It's amazing our perception. It's like, it's like we struggle to trust God when we're, when we're facing something. Man, I'm, I'm going, I got to go through this. I, I really got to go through this. And you struggle to trust him. Only to get to the other side victorious. Look back. And now you're saying, whoa, I'm glad I went through this. Man, it helped me grow by going through this. Could you imagine if we had that same attitude starting it? Instead of saying, whoa, I can't believe what's in front of me. Oh, man, I'm just going through a lot. No, looking at what's in front of you and saying, man, what, what's going to come out of this? What's going to come out of this trial that I'm going to get so much better? My faith is going to get so much bigger. My joy is going to get so much larger. Man, if I have that kind of attitude. No, friends, you've been, been through so much. You've been wounded. You've been hit. You've been smacked. And guess what? You're alive today. You're breathing. You're in the house of God. You're watching online. There's nothing to fear what's in front of you. Could it be that you're just going to go through it to get another scar? So it's that you can show someone else. I was talking to a pastor yesterday on the phone, and he's going, he texts me, and he's called him up, and he's going through a situation where, where they just, they, they got a miracle in front of them, and, and they got to raise money, and they got to do all these things, and it was, it was so interesting talking to him on the phone, and I can hear the panic, I can hear the anxiety, I can hear the stress, I can hear it, and in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, that was me four months ago. <laughs> At the end of the day, I was able to share with him. Friends, listen, I said, look it, if God guides, he provides. Listen, if God made a way, he's going to make the way. I said, listen, you're not, you're not called to be a fundraiser. You don't need to be a fundraiser. No, you've been called to go before the throne of God, represent the people of God, and God will put it on the hearts of others. And Lisette and I have watched miracles after miracles, and we're about to unload another miracle on the church in just a few more weeks. And you're going to look back and say, oh, God, what's happening at death? I'm telling you, it's crazy what's happening. I was, I, I, I'll give you a prime example. Today, I was on the phone with five attorneys, five different attorneys. I was driving. We were driving. We left our house. We got from our house to Jefferson. I hang up the phone. I said, yeah, they said that was eight minutes. That was $100. That cost $100. That eight minutes. And, I, and when I talk to attorneys, you guys will know this. When I talk to attorneys, I, I, I keep my phone like this. I don't keep it like this. I keep it like this because I'm watching the time. And then when they start asking me like, oh, how's your kids? I'm like, oh, no, we ain't talking about that right now. No, 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 because cause we, on, we on the clock. You know what I'm saying? So you can talk about my kids. Text me about that. You know, I'm, yeah, no, that, ain't, that ain't happening. You know what I'm talking about. That ain't happening, right? But, 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 but at the end of the day, the scars. Your test because, becomes somebody else's victory while they're going through the test. And so, so the purpose of Jesus was his scars to remain so that it's the evidence of what he did for our life. So what were the reasonings of these scars on his body? What did they mean to you and I? The first thing you have to understand is the whip. And that whip literally means freedom in my body. In those days, a whip was made out of leather. And they would attach very sharp rocks to them. And when they would hit and lash your body, it would be like nails going right into your body. And then they would twist it and they'd yank it back so that it can literally shed your skin. There was a reason why there were 39. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24 says this, He himself bore our sins 
and in and on his body uh, uh, in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed just think about that for a moment not your wounds his wounds that his wounds became healing to your wounds. Can, can, I, can I help you out here for a second? At the end of the day, you don't need to wound yourself just to wound yourself. Some people just live a continual life being wounded, get in toxic relationships, one after the other. You sit there sometimes and say, well, I learned the last time. No, you didn't. You're still in another one. Man, get what around. Same toxic friends. And you're just self-afflicting wounds on you. No, friends, listen to me. His wounds healed your wounds. 39 stripes on his back. for 39 diseases, 39 medical categories of diseases so that by his stripes, every disease lies within 39 categories. For one stripe, it heals a category of diseases. So when there was 39 stripes on his back, not 40, 39, it was that every disease that would ever hit this earth will be covered by the stripes that he bore on his back so that your wounds can be what? Healed. You don't have to walk around wounded anymore. If you're walking around wounded, it's because you want to stay wounded. At the end of the day, there is a remedy for your wounds, and that remedy is his wounds. And those wounds that were on his back are the remedy for the wounds on your life. And listen, you don't have to live another day with wounds on your body, wounds on your life, wounds in your past. His blood washes all those away. That whip. Not only that whip, but the second thing were the thorns. Why, why was there thorns? So that you and I can have freedom in our minds. I love what, what, what Genesis says because Genesis actually gives us really the true essence of what this is about. As you know, Jesus came as the second Adam. He came as the second Adam because the first Adam messed it all up. So the first Adam was placed in the garden. The second Adam was placed in the tomb within the garden. The first Adam, the first Adam gave birth to a bride. The second Adam gave birth to the bride called the church. The first Adam had a relationship with God that whatever he named, those animals became. The second Adam names righteousness on what the first Adam messed up. So he renames your life. And so when Adam was placed in the garden, everything was perfect. It grew to prosper. And then Adam eats and partakes of the apple, and the Lord God curses the woman, but look how he curses the man. And he says, and Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife. That's how my wife talks to me. I'm like, are you sure? Don't mess me up because you messed up. You waited first. You ain't getting me to bite. 
Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Watch this. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So the curse of plenty and abundance came with Adam by God cursing the ground that at one time was fruitful to grow thorns, so it chokes the plants. This is why Jesus is given a parable in Matthew chapter 13, and he says this in Matthew 13. He says, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And so the purpose of thorns is to suffocate or choke the plants so that it does not produce its full harvest. So there's a reason why Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head. And he threw a crown of thorns on his head because the first curse was that it would come from the ground and it would choke the harvest. Jesus says, give me what's choked the harvest. I'm going to place that on the head of my life. And listen, no longer will there be a curse of poverty over your thinking. Poverty is not your economic status. Poverty is your mindset. You got to be poor in the mind before you're poor in the pocket. You believe that. I believe to be dependent on that person and that government and that. No, you believe that. You don't have to believe that. You're a child of God. You got to let the thorns hit your head. Because at the end of the day, he's redeemed you from that thing. He broke the spirit of poverty on your mind. You don't live low because where you grew up, you live low because you've accepted that. You're not living paycheck to paycheck because you don't have a great job. You're living a paycheck to paycheck because you chose that. When you don't tie, that chokes your harvest. Come on, I know I get quiet there. You want to live, listen, you want to, abundance doesn't start here. Abundance starts here. You got to start thinking bigger. You got to start declaring bigger. You got to start dreaming bigger. You got to lay off the limitations off your mind and allow God to expand it. You're not smart enough to give you your dreams. You're not wise enough to wake up every morning with all the strategy that you wake up with. Your education does not match your competency and capacity that God has placed in your life. So you cannot allow the thorns of the past of the first Adam to choke the harvest in your life. Can I go deeper? You know, I I love that. I love talking about this. You want to know the purpose of addiction? Simple. The purpose of addiction is to do two things. Break you and keep you broke. It breaks you and you will end up broke. You know what the purpose of drugs is? Break you and keep you broke. It's not a, it doesn't start off with, oh, I'm just going to wake up and be an alcoholic. I'm going to wake up and be a drug addict. No, no. It starts off in your mind. Stinking thinking. Believing a lie of what it can do for you. All you're doing is allowing the thorns to grow, to choke the seed that God has placed of enlargement in your mind. It's why every day I wake up and I declare that I'm the head and not the tail. 
I'm blessed going in and blessed coming out. I'm favored of God. I declare every day that my mind is alert. My mind is fixed on you. I thank you that my thoughts are, my thoughts are your thoughts and my ways are your ways. Father, I declare that my mind is enlarged today, that you've crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercies because kindness doesn't start here. Kindness starts here. Kindness doesn't start here. Kindness starts here. You got to choose to be kind before you are kind. Joy doesn't start here. Joy starts here because joy is not a feeling. Joy is a choice. I choose to love today because love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. And feelings follow choices. And when you choose every day, oh, woe is me. Well, guess what? Woe is me going to follow you. You choose every day. Listen, listen, at the end of the day, he put the crown of thorns on his head so he can break the spirit of low living, poverty thinking over your life. You've been redeemed from that. He's given you a brand new mindset. He's given you a new way of thinking. He's given you fresh thoughts. If you have a resurrected life, you shouldn't be thinking about your old life. Hello, somebody. How can you be in the promised land and still be feasting on the things in Egypt? And of course, it's scary. That's how Joshua felt. They looked in the front of the land. They said, whoa, look at all those pomegranates. Those things are massive. Those grapes are big. Why? Because your future is always going to be bigger than your present. All your future does is try to intimidate the size that you are now. And if you start measuring up yourself to the future, you're always going to lose. Because your future will always be bigger than the size you are right now. And so at the end of the day, the purpose of your future is to marginalize and minimize your life. Hello? So the only people that give you the ability to marginalize your life are the people you give permission to to accept it. I'm not going to accept being marginalized. You're not going to tell me what I can't do. You can't place a limitation on my life. I serve an unlimited God. He has broke that curse. My grandma was broke. My grandma, grandma was broke. My grand, grandma, grandma, grandma was broke. I ain't going to be broke. I'm going to be blessed. And blessed means a lot of things. Blessed means healthy. Come on, blessed means happy. Blessed means joyful. It's not always what's in your bank account. Listen, it's what in your, it's what it's, 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 it's your heart account. I want to be blessed here, and then it just overflows everywhere else. But you got to every day, I choose to be blessed. I choose to walk in the blessings of God. I choose to walk in the favor of God. No, I choose to walk in the abundance of God. Everywhere I'm going, abundance is going. The Bible says in Psalms 23, good and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Listen, I'm never shocked when I'm blessed. I was at the store last month. I was sitting there just, you know, watching my daughter look at some stuff. And I went and looked at these shoes. And I was like, oh, man, these are nice, man. I put them back, you know. And I was thinking, man, should I buy them? They look awfully nice on my feet. That guy walks up to me, never met him before. He says, man, I've been going to Destiny for a few months. You've changed my life. He says, I saw you. I've been watching you. I saw you pick up them shoes. You need to buy them. I said, oh, well, I've been contemplating that. <laughs> and he says, oh, no, no, I'm buying them for you. I said, well, good and mercy follow me all the days of my life. At the end of the day, I declare those things. Walk in that favor. When I was in sales, I, 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 would, tell, I, I, I would tell my clients, just give me five minutes. It's all I need. Just give me five minutes. And I'd pull up to that, their office, their athletic training office, and I'd sit in that parking lot. I said, Lord, your word declares according to Deuteronomy 28 that if I'm blessed going in, I've got to be blessed coming out. So I declare that, and I release favor angels right now into that meeting, and I thank you, Lord, that I'm coming out with this contract. Never failed. Never failed. 
At the end of the day, I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed coming out. The Job 22, 28 says, the words in which you declare, so will they be established. I declare what thus saith the Lord. Say, I'm just repeating what the word says. I'm not repeating my words. I'm just repeating your words. And I'm repeating what you call me. I didn't wake up and think about this about my life. I never thought I'd be the head and not the tail. But you thought that about me, so I'm just going to agree with you. Amen, right? I mean, think about your life. You've agreed with a lot of people what they've called you. Well, why don't you agree with what the Word says? I agree that the Word says I'm the apple of, man, Lord, if you call me the apple of your eye, then I agree what your Word says. I'm the apple of your eyes. If your word declares, man, that, 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 that I shall walk in health, then, Lord, I thank you that, that I agree with that. That's what your word says. So you ought to start agreeing with the word. Yeah. Amen, right? Yeah. And so at the end of the day, it frees your mind, frees your thinking. He broke that curse. So you don't have to stress, worry, have anxiety. No, you You walk in the peace of God. You know what the word peace means? It means shalom. It means lacking nothing. That I wake up every day with peace. I am lacking nothing. I'm walking in that peace. So the whip, listen, the thorns, and then he had the nails, which is freedom in my hands. Why, 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 why were there nails there? Here's what 2 Timothy says this. It says this. 1 Timothy says, Therefore I encourage the men to pray on every occasion with hands lifted to God in worship, with clean hearts, free from the frustration or strife. You, 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 you want to know why his hands were pierced? Because he knew one day your hands would be an extension of heaven to somebody else. Matter of fact, the, script, the Word of God says that if we're not careful, the blood of the city or the people could be on your hands. Friends, His hands redeemed your hands. The Bible says, whatever you touch shall prosper. Why? Because at the end of the day, His hands redeemed your hands. He's the one that put gifts and talents in your hands. You want to make sure every day that I'm extending my hands in prayer. Lord, these are holy hands. Lord, these are hands you can trust. And here's what I do. Listen to me. Here's what I do every day. Listen to me. Here's what I do every day. I say, Lord, I dedicate my hands to you. When you told Moses to build the tabernacle, you told him, to anoint the hands of those who would be skillful workers to build your place of habitation. Anoint these hands. Listen, here's what I do. I turn my hands over like this, and I say, now that my hands are anointed, trust me what you want me to deliver to other people. I'm going to tell you what God's attracted to. He's attracted to holy hands. Don't keep your hands closed because you'll try to hold on to what he's put inside of it. Keep your hands open the same way you keep your heart open. If you're not careful, your hands will follow your heart. When you begin to have closed hands, you'll have a closed heart. You don't want to have a closed heart because of closed hands. Now, I want my hands to remain open. I want God, I want you to trust me with things that you're going to place in these hands. Not only does God put things in your hands, but he puts people in your hands. God, trust me with the people. Trust me with your employees. Trust me with the people I'm leading. Lord, I know they're in my hands. They're in my care. God, I want to keep my hands holy because I want to keep my heart holy. Friends, you don't have to walk around with contaminated hands that have robbed God and have robbed people. I'll never forget, one of my friends decided as a little boy, let's just go steal some candy. So we went to the store, and we looked around. There was no cameras back in them days. So we looked around, and 
And I remember the first candy I ever stole was a fun dip. <laughs> it was a little stick with a grape package. And I would eat half of the fun dip, and then I'd take the rest of it and put it in water because I couldn't afford Kool-Aid. Yeah, I, 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 I tell you stories about that. And I remember we got away with it. I remember going back the next day. Bought some now laters, but this time I stole some Fun Dip and some Snickers. I remember going to school, and I was handing my friends, here's a Snicker bar. Here's Fun Dip. They're like, oh, man, where'd you get this? I'm like, dude, dude, I'm, I'm rolling right now. I'm rolling, right? And you know this, when you were a kid, come on, some of you remember, some of you... When you had all the candy on the playground, you was king, right? You was king, right? You had all the girls, everything. Remember, you give the girl a little Milky Way with a little note that says, do you want to go around, circle yes or no? So one day I got all these orders from my friends. Dude, I want a Snickers. Give me a fun dip. Give me this. All this kind of stuff. So me and my friend went for it. Went to the store. Had a big jacket. Looking around. No one was there. We started sticking stuff in. Started sticking more stuff in. Started sticking more stuff in. We bought some stuff and then we left. We're on our bikes and we're riding home and we're having fun. Ah, can you believe what we did? We just stole a bunch of candy. Did it? Get home. Have the candy. Realize some of the candy's missing. But as we were riding home, the candy was falling out. And Mrs. Lou, the owner of the store, followed the candy. Ended up at my house, knocked on the door, had the candy, and told my mom, your son has been coming in my store and stealing. And I remember my mom inviting her to the table, being so kind. And Mrs. Lou took a stapler and stapled my hand. Not hit it, staple it. And my mom didn't say nothing. Like, in other words, you deserve it. I'm like, you should have just stuck a note. She punished my hands. But those hands deserve to be punished because I never stole a piece of candy again. Not because I didn't want the candy. I didn't want the staple. See, that's what the devil does. You've been stealing from people. Stealing from God. And you get stapled. You wonder why your hands are always empty. And the reason why is because his hands were pierced. So you don't have to reap the percussions of what your hands did and where your hands were in the wrong place. Your hands need to remain holy because God wants to put holy things into your hands. The last thing as I close, number four, was the spear. It's freedom to live as his bride. Well, why, why did that spear take place? Freedom to live as his bride. You remember in Genesis, God finds Adam and realizes he needs a bride. He puts him to sleep. Opens up his rib. Pulls a rib out. And that one rib became his prime rib, becomes his wife. God does the same thing. John 19 says this. John 19 says, but when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, now listen to me. In those days, if you were crucified, the first thing they did when they took you off the cross was to break your legs. It was customary 
But this is so significant because Isaiah prophesied the one in whom would be crucified will not have a bone broken on his body. How did they skip him and not everybody else? Because not everybody else was the Lamb of God. Now, if you go deeper, the word bone in biblical symbolism means promise. It is why the promise that was on Joseph was the promise that he would be favored amongst everyone, even his own family and his own brothers. So when Joseph died, they took his bones in a box, and as long as Israel had his bones, the favor rested on them. The, the, the promise that was on Elijah was the promise of an anointed one, the first one that was anointed by God in some sense, like Jesus. A mantle of anointing was on him. Elijah raised someone from the dead, a resurrection anointing upon him. Elijah dies. They go bury his bone in the fields. One day there's another soldier fighting. And when the soldier gets killed, the Bible says, and the soldier fell on the grounds in which were the bones of Elijah. And when, as soon as he hit the ground, he resurrected. Want to know why? Because his bones were still alive with that anointing on them. The Bible says that not a bone was broken in the life of Jesus. Want to know why? Because bones means promises. And if a bone was, would have been broken, it would have gave him permission to break a promise. That's why the Bible says the promises of God are yes and amen. If he said it, it shall come to pass. And so there was a reason why they did not break his legs. Because they could not. He could not allow them to break a promise. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus with his side. When did he pierce Jesus in his side? When Jesus was dead. When did, G when did God open up the side of Adam? When he was asleep. And he pushes the spear, bringing a sudden flow. Look at the order. Blood and water. Salvation and baptism. So the first bride came out of Adam's side. The second bride, which is the church, you and I came from the side of Jesus. Hey, wait a minute. You crucified my hands so their hands would be holy. You, cruci you gave me the crown of thorns so I could break poverty. You put the 39 stripes on my back so I can heal the disease. Don't forget to pierce my side because I can't finish without my bride coming with me. Come on, are you hearing me? Look what it says. These things happened. What things? What things was he talking about? Not a thing. These things happened. What were the things? All of it. So that the scripture would be what? Fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Not one of his promises will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Can I tell you something? As I close, can I give you this? Everything was done for a purpose so that you will live a life that is lacking nothing and being completely, completely completed. Friends, this is what your resurrection life should look like. 
nothing like your life used to look like. A resurrection life looks like your life doesn't look like your life that it used to look like. This is what he's done for you. He was pierced. He was striped. He had a crown of thorns. He, was, he had nails in his hands so that your life would be ultimately complete. If you're walking in lack because you don't have a complete revelation of resurrection, the goal for your life during these next few days, give me a continual revelation of resurrection that I would walk in the freedom that God has for my life in Jesus' name. Come on, you receive that today? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for this Wednesday. Lord, as we head towards Good Friday and Resurrection Weekend, Lord, we thank you that all of these scars were there because God, they play such a significant role in our own life right now. So we honor you today and love you and bless you. We thank you for it. And Lord, we ask, God, that you would just touch us. You would heal us. Lord, as, as we crown our minds right now, we break all stinking thinking. We break over our minds old mindsets, old habits. Lord, as our, as our hands are pierced, Father, let our hands be holy. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse our hands from anything we've robbed from you and from others. Lord, as our feet are pierced, Lord, we ask that you would cleanse our feet from trying to go a direction we were never led to go by, going our own ways, taking our own paths. Lord, we ask that your blood would cover our feet. Lord, I thank you, Father, for our hearts that they would remain pure and holy, humble and righteous before you. Lord, give us a continual revelation of resurrection every day. We're brand new creations in Christ Jesus. And thank you that we'll never be ashamed of our scars, for surely our pain will become a breakthrough for somebody else. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say amen. Amen. Come on, you received that today. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Let me just tell you really quick, before we leave, you can stand to your feet. We have Good Friday coming up at 6.30. It's going to be a time of communion. It's going to be great. I'm going to be, you know, it's proven to be, it's proven to be the darkest day ever recorded in earth's history. And I'm going to be talking about what it's like to live your brightest days and your darkest hour. It's, 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 it's going to be a blessing. You're going to love it. And then lastly, Resurrection Sunday. Listen, we have services all day. Seven. It's the only services we're giving donuts. Donuts and coffee. It's kind of like our, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, it, it, is a it, it is a sunrise service. So if you like it early, I like early. I love early. Listen, get here at 7, 8.30. 10 o'clock, 11.30. There's no 6 o'clock or you coming here by yourself. <laughs> I got to tell you something. Today, we had a meeting this morning, and it was hilarious. Think, speaking of donuts, one of the guys walks in with two dozen donuts from Krispy Kreme. The other guy comes in with one dozen donuts from Krispy Kreme. And I said, watch the next person come with some Krispy Kreme donuts. Sure enough, the other person comes with three dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. We had six dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. I'm watching all these guys eating their Krispy Kreme donuts. And I'm just thanking the Lord. They said, Pastor, you don't want a donut? I'm fasting. But at least I ain't going to look like a donut. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. So. So, <laughs> that's wrong, huh? 
But can I say it won't be Friday morning? Y'all want to go to Krispy Kreme Donuts? Hey, jelly donuts. Y'all don't know nothing about jelly donuts. That's what we're going to have here at 7 in the morning. So get here. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be awesome. We're excited about Easter. Hey, our last Easter in this building. And so we're very, very excited about that. Never know. Might be our last Easter in all our places. Never know. Never know. Father, we love you today. We give you all the praise, all the glory for what you're doing in our lives. Bless every single person. Bless this week. Lord, let us keep in reminder every day the blessing. And we ask this in Jesus' name with your hands stretched. May the Lord bless you, cause his face to shine on you, and his blessings go before you. We bless you in the name of the Lord that the rest of this week will be the best of your week. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say amen. amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you, everybody.